Hello and welcome to another episode of Leaders of Transformation. Today we're going to talk about developing leaders that people want to follow. And you know that's really important because if you're a leader and you want to inspire others and make an impact and influence people, uh, there are some things that you need to know to be able to do that. And so our guest is going to share with us from her experience, 20 plus years of experience in doing this. And so I'm really excited to have her here. I've been on her show and now I'm going to have her here uh, sharing her with our listeners. That's you and our viewers. And so Haleli Azule is a consultant, facilitator, and leader's Ship development strategist, author, and speaker. Uh, she speaks at international conferences and corporate meetings, and she speaks on leadership, communication skills, and emotional intelligence. Uh, she's the author of two books, Employee Development on a Shoestring and Strength to Strength, How Working from Your Strengths Can Help You Lead a More Fulfilling Life. A woman after my own heart because I uh, talk about uh, playing to your strengths all the time. So her books, workshops, and retreats build on her 20 plus years of uh, professional experience in employee and leadership development in corporate, government, nonprofit, and academic organizations. What I love about that is that she crosses such a broad scope um, that uh, she can pull from different sectors, uh, industry sectors, and apply them to others. And so uh, she brings a unique take on leadership from that perspective. She offers actionable leadership insights and advice on her blog and her leadership podcast, which is uh, called The Talent Grow Show. I said I've been on her show, and now it's the opportunity for her to be on my show. And I don't always do that uh, with a guest because it doesn't always necessarily apply. But in this case, it totally applies because we're talking about leadership and empowering people to be leaders of transformation. So we're really excited that you're here. Uh, Halali, we're excited that you're here. Welcome to Leaders of Transformation. Thank you, Nicole. I'm excited to be here and thank you for inviting me. Oh, it's a pleasure. And so let's dive in actually, right? You know, we talk about leadership and there's so many people nowadays talking about leadership development. How do we become more effective leaders? It's amazing because I know you've been in the business for a long time you know, do you notice that there's a lot more conversation about this nowadays? I think that people have always been interested in that. I mean, when you look at nations and cultures and tribes and families, you know, leadership has always been something that people uh, look for. And there's people who rise up to be leaders. And then the people who want to become leaders always look for tips and things that they can figure out. How can I emulate? You know, what, what, do I need so that I can rise up to be a leader? So in some ways, I think we've, as, as people, we've always had leaders and we've always been interested in that, like who rises up and what, what makes for a good leader. But we hear about it more because of social media, probably. Yes. Good point. Good point. And I think maybe, maybe it's been my radar because it's, you know, there was a time when I actually didn't see myself as a leader, I never thought of it. I just did what I was doing until somebody actually said, wow, you're quite, you know, the leader. And I went, really? Never really thought about it that way. So, um, and then I realized how passionate I was, why I was so passionate about it. I've seen great leadership uh, in my, you know, in my 30 plus years experience of being in business. I've also seen really crappy leadership, um, having it done well and having it done not so well. And I know you have as well. And so, um, so we're going to talk about that today. But let's start off with why you're so passionate about leadership and developing leaders within organizations. I think in a similar way, I've seen good leadership and experienced it. And I've seen really crappy leadership and experienced it. And in some ways, I'm on a mission to help less people experience crappy leaders because, and also, you know, in a very empathetic way and compassionate way, I want to help more leaders avoid being crappy leaders because I really believe that most of the people who turn out to be crappy leaders, bad managers, are not intentionally doing that. It's that they're just thrown into it. Most of the time, they're promoted without any kind of preparation. They're expected to just, you know, jump off the cliff and fly somehow. And um, for m many people are, are not born with leadership skills and it is something, good news, it's something that's learnable. It's not something that is either born or not, 
by anyone can learn it, but everybody needs to work on developing those leadership skills. And lots of times people are just not afforded the opportunity and they themselves just aren't sure how to do that. So in some ways, my mission is to help those people uh, learn what do they need to do differently so that they can be more effective as leaders. But ultimately, I'm also helping every employee out there who's um, potentially under a bad leader to no longer need to be in that kind of a situation. And for organizations, you know, the, the statistics say that most people leave jobs uh, because they're leaving a manager. So organizations often lose their top performers, their best performers first. And it's almost always because those people are feeling like they're leader is not supporting them in a way that allows them to thrive. So for organizations, there's so much to gain by developing leaders. And so those are really three different beneficiaries. I would say it's kind of benefiting everyone all around. And I feel strongly that I can help with that. Yeah. Well, it's funny that I was kind of chuckling because I'm thinking, I don't know where the crappy leader term, you know, because I was, I don't normally call them that, but I, I've been the crappy leader, you know, sure. and, I, and I didn't know what to do in the Me beginning. too. Like, okay, so this is where we're going to go. This is what we're going to do. And realizing that wasn't the best approach. And so, um, but being an effective leader, yes, um, I think is, uh, is, is so important. And unfortunately, organizations don't invest the money. I actually had another guest on a while back, uh, Tiana Sanchez, and she was talking about statistics of how much time is invested in training leaders uh, or new managers as they're coming up through the ranks and into that leadership role. And it's like next to nothing. Yeah. And so how can we expect people to be effective in the leadership role that they're, that they're, you know, that they're uh, put into if we don't give them the tools? Now, I know there's, there's uh, a lot of organizations now that are saying, well, you know, I, we don't have the budget, you know, we can't afford to put training in. I mean, I remember one time I actually called on a, um, it was a cold call, a prospecting call on a real estate broker. And he had a number of over a hundred uh, agents. And I was suggesting that we could do some training to support his agents. And I'll never forget, he had been around for uh, many years in the industry and older gentleman. And he said, I don't train them. They either sink or swim. And I'm like, yes. wow, you know what? That is such a waste of human capital and human confidence. People that could potentially be so amazing, they just need a little guidance and tools. You're basically saying, good luck, figure it out on your own. And that is such a waste of time yeah. when you know, people have gone before, they figured out, you know, like how do you go in through a minefield? You know, hopefully we never have to do it. But, you know, the, the business world can be a minefield in, in certain ways. The, the world of people development can be a minefield. How do you do that? You follow someone else. So now you have a book that talks about employee development on a shoestring. And uh, so that excuse about we don't, we can't afford it or there's no point in doing it because it doesn't make a difference. It doesn't fly. So tell us a little bit about how you work with organizations who are saying we can't afford to do it, but we yeah. know it's important. Yeah. And I've, I've had the same conversations with the sink or swim. It's, it's really, it's mind boggling and it's heart wrenching because yeah. those poor people that do, that report to that leader, you know, are, are suffering, they're struggling. So yeah, first of all, it is important and we do invest in things that return higher uh, yielding returns than the investment. And I bet you that there are lots and lots of ways that you can see the returns on an investment in developing people. But let's, let's leave that for that, that guest that you had with the statistics. I'm not here for that. It's more like we don't have to make it complicated or expensive for it to help. So I, because I had so much of that same conversation, I decided I'm going to write a book because um, there, I can help. There's so many ways, but here's the thing. Like I said earlier, most people that are in a position to develop others, you know, leaders, that's one of their main roles, roles is to develop others are, are often not really, they're not 
they didn't learn what they're supposed to do. No one taught them. So even just how to create development opportunities is something that's outside of the realm of their expertise and makes sense. You know, you're good at electrical engineering or you're good at, you know, developing medical devices or you're good at being a real estate agent. You're not necessarily good at being a leader or developing people. So um, my book is really to just sort of help cut, you know, kind of uh, help shorten the, the learning curve. But the idea is this. If, if you want to develop people, what you need to think first about is what skills and competencies and knowledge do they need to develop, one, to succeed in their current role, but also to help prepare them for their next role. And their next role might be within your organization, within a, another department in your organization, and it might be outside of your organization because let's face it, people do not work until they get the gold watch and the retirement plan anymore in the same one place, right? But um, as a leader, if you want people to, to, to be at their best, they need to feel like they're learning and growing and they need to be able to keep up with everything's changing so fast. They need to upgrade their skills and their knowledge all the time. So a lot of times people are like, well, I don't know. Let me pull up some catalog I got in the mail for some training company, right? Oh yeah, $99. That's a good one. Um, and let's send them to training. But you know, you can't keep people out of their job and away from their desk and sending them to training. That's just not practical. It's cost prohibitive because most training is pretty costly. And it's also, there's that opportunity cost, but also let's face it, there are certain things that aren't best learned by sitting in a training classroom, right? And, or that's just not the most efficient way to do it. So let's think outside the classroom, outside the box. And then you actually open up so many opportunities that don't necessarily cost a lot of money. And I can give you examples of what I mean by that. I have 11 different methods in my book that you can think about. And they're just sort of not the only methods there are, but just the most popular ones. So for example, you mentioned, uh, you talked about a similar theme earlier, which is mentoring. You know, mentoring, both being a mentor, but also getting a mentor can be developmental. So let's think about if you want to develop leadership skills in someone, but you don't really have a promotion quite ready yet, or they're not ready for a promotion because they don't have the leadership skills that uh, that they need for that. Well, being a mentor is such a great way to develop those skills in a very low key way. Now that doesn't cost a lot of money. It doesn't take a lot of time and they can do it within the organization, but also they can mentor someone outside the organization, right? They can go and mentor a college student or someone early in their career. They can go to their professional association and find people there that would love to learn from them. So mentoring others is a great way to build leadership skills, listening skills, coaching coaching skills. Um, becoming a mentee or a protege is a great way to learn things from people who have done it before. So mentoring is one of those 11 examples. Another one that I can give you is that I used actually in my career is volunteering. A lot of people don't think about volunteering as a development method, right? We usually think about volunteering as really benefiting whoever it is that we're serving in a service capacity. And that's true and you still do, but you can also benefit yourself. So for example, if you want to build um, public speaking skills, well, you can volunteer to lead a group, you know, or to uh, speak for free at organizations. If you want to develop organizational or project management skills, you don't have to go to a project management class. You can volunteer with your local chapter, or with your local food bank, or with your house of worship or whatever, and you can manage a project. And so you can build the skills on the um, on the job, but it's a volunteer job. It's not affecting your day-to-day -day job. It's not costing anyone money. And those skills actually stay with you and you transfer them to your job. So they absolutely uh, convey. You get to develop skills, but it's a way that doesn't, that doesn't require a corporate program. Yeah, I love that actually, because as you were saying that I was thinking about the community aspect, oftentimes we think of this leadership development as, yeah, you've got to go to some event, some workshop, and you're going to get all these skills. But the reality is those skills get developed in experiential, you know, in, in, even in the workshop, it's most effective if they're actually interacting with other people. And right. so why not just make the entire weekday a workshop of sorts where there's opportunities where people can get mentored and other people can learn mentorship. So there's, they're actually learning it. I, I know that for me, when I first became a coach, I had people that um, were coming to me and saying, Oh, I, I, you know, can you coach me? Can you coach me? And I'm like, Oh, I'm, 
I'm not a coach, right? I was thinking therapist, yeah. right? The black couch and so forth. I'm like, no. So, but finally I said, okay, well, let's, let's give this a shot. And so what I did is I hired a coach. Now, a lot of times people will go to coaching programs, right? And learn it there. I thought, well, the best way to do it uh, was, and th this was back before coaching became such a huge industry. Yeah. I just hired a coach so that I could learn from them. And in the same way, if someone can get, have a mentor within the organization, they can learn the same way, not only as a mentee, they'll learn the skills they need, but also they'll learn what their mentor did to them. And so there's a perpetuating process. And then when you talk about the volunteering, when we think about what organizations are really looking at nowadays is they want to be seen as supporting the community. People invest, they buy from companies that are doing good. We know that, right? Yeah. And statistics prove that. So if they can encourage their team to do that, maybe even do some things together, they can get the, the double whammy of, you know, um, making a difference in the community and building their leaders at the same time. And it doesn't cost them a lot of money to do it. Exactly. Um, so the fantastic. caveat about volunteering is it has to be voluntary. I really yeah. don't believe that you can force someone to volunteer. No. Yeah. Just, you know, it sounds, it's an oxymoron. We're going to go do this and you're coming. It's really obvious, but yeah. people still try to do it. That's one. And then the other thing is, like you said, you, you are already... You, you already have some interest in doing it. Most people have an interest in doing it. And so it's not doing more or different. It's really just building an additional lens so that you can see it from that perspective. And then you can also draw that additional value. And I think that what's, what's most important with development is thinking about it strategically in a goal-oriented way. So rather than just choosing some random method and then just trying it out, which becomes kind of like flavor of the month or you know, just sort of gimmicky, you think first, what does the person need to develop? And how do they learn best? And what is the constraints on time and budget and so on? And so based on the criteria and the constraints and, and the factors that are in the situation and the context, then you can choose a method that can fit. And then when they go do whatever it is, mentoring or volunteering or uh, serving on a special team or you know, whatever it is that you choose for them to do, then they need to have a development goal and then they need to have ways to track whether they are actually successfully developing come back and meet once a month or to journal about it do something so that they can be sure that they actually are picking up the value and the benefits rather than just sort of happenstance it might like it might hit them and they won't know it right so what i'm hearing is structure and the fluidity and flexibility based on like you're what you were talking about um with um the strengths, right? Is having yeah. people play to their strengths, but also measure that as well. Now, what do you do with people that just don't get it? You know, they're just, they're struggling, right? Mm -hmm. They've got some barriers. Maybe there's some, I know you talk a lot about emotional intelligence. There's mm -hmm. some, there's some serious gaps there that uh, blind spots, shall we say, that um, people have good intentions. I, I, I agree with you. What you said earlier is that, you know, people don't intend to be a poor leader. They just don't have the skills to do it. They want to do well. I believe that everybody wants to do well. And I mean, there, there are a few bad, bad apples out there, you know, but they're just not the majority. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So what do you do with the ones that are just, that are really, they've got that blind spot and it's just not working? So you mean bad leaders that just don't see it? Yeah. Ones that are trying to get it, but that are not getting it. You know, they're not, it's not, it's not landing. It's not sticking. I'm sure you've had experiences where it's just, it's not every time does it work like clockwork and it's no. like, Oh, they're just an amazing leader now. Right. So what do you do with, with those yeah. cases? Well, so there are two perspectives here. One is the individual and their own development. And the other is the organization and what's at stake. So from, from the individual perspective, the leader, if they don't get it, you know, there, there are ways that you can try to get to them. You know, there are ways that might be, maybe they don't find them as credible sources, but there are others that they would find as credible sources. So for example, uh, allowing them an opportunity to get input from others that they, that they trust and that whose opinion they value in a way that seems credible to them rather than you know, maybe they think something's manipulated or, or misleading or, you know, people uh, fake their answers on some 360 
instrument, you know, th there are those skeptics out there so that they will not accept that feedback because they won't think it's credible or valid. Um, but finding ways to give them insights from people that they find credible and, uh, and valid. Um, ultimately, we all can only be accountable for ourselves for changing. I don't think that you can force someone to change, you know? So if someone is really struggling, they need to change and they won't. Um, they're just, for whatever reason, but they just don't have, um, they personally don't have the intrinsic motivation to make that change and to work hard to learn new skills and to, and to improve and to make a change. Ultimately, you can't really force them to do it. So I think that you can try to influence them using different methods because they might not be valuing the methods you've used thus far from an organization. That's a great point. Yeah, yeah. that's like, that's a great point because, uh, the, it's like, there's a saying, you know, if, if people are not doing, um, well, and there's a consistency, it's not the people, it's the system. When a sports team is not doing well, they don't fire the players, they fire the coach. And so in the same way, I'm not saying that you need to fire the coach, but, um, or the, like the leader, the, the CEO in this case, mm -hmm. but you got to look at it and saying, are we providing the tools? And like you said, if, yeah, if they don't see the value or they are skeptical about the source or the intention, mm -hmm. maybe they came from an organization which was manipulative, which was pushy and demanding and wanting them to do something really not pretending like they were interested in them, but then not really being yeah. interested in them. And then of course they're going to bring that baggage into the, an experience into this next, you know, uh, situation. And so to look at it from a different angle. I believe that everybody is reachable at some level. There's, there's a teacher out there, there's a supporter, there's a mentor out there for, for pretty much everyone, maybe not every, yeah. you know, there's, there's always those anomalies. Um, but it's coming at it from a different, uh, from a different angle. So, yeah. Yeah. Actually, I mean, you know, influence is sort of in the, in the, uh, in the mind of the receiver, you know, you, you, yeah. you can try to influence someone, but ultimately are you having the impact you intended? And you can, so you need to vary your methods to try to get across to them because we can't force anyone to do anything. Yeah. Thankfully. And, and for the organization, I would say if you've tried as much as you could mm -hmm. and you know, at some point you have to say, is, is there diminishing returns? And What's the harm versus the benefit that this person is adding to the organization? And this is a challenge in many organizations because some people are top, you know, maybe they're top salespeople or top performers or whatever it is, and they're bringing in revenue and the organization may value that more than the damage um, that they're causing to the morale of their team or the people that are leaving the organization as a result of this manager's behavior. So sometimes there, there are definitely costs and there are, um, th you know, there are benefits they're bringing in and there are costs they're causing. And for the organization, you have to put those on the scale and see which one is outweighed by the other one. And then, you know, organizations also have to just make objective, neutral, uh, strategic decisions about what's in the long-term interest of that organization. I just think that sometimes people underestimate the effect or the, the serious or severity of the cost on human resources on people uh, of a bad manager. And because they do that, it actually makes everyone feel less valued by the organization. And it causes yeah. all, you know, the statistics are that most people are disengaged in the job. I mean, this is just dismal, but I think in many ways when people feel like, you know, you're not protecting me from someone who is abusing uh, me or, or treating me poorly or doesn't care about me or my goals or my learning or my success. I don't feel like you as an organization care by you allowing that to continue to happen. You're enabling this, which means that you're communicating to me in an indirect way about the value that I bring. And therefore, you know, I would, and I would suggest to them, take yourself elsewhere because you are not a slave. Right. Yeah. I mean, the, the cost, the ripple effect mm -hmm. of it. Um, one of my mentors, I remember he told this uh, story of going into this uh, large insurance company, um, well known, everybody would know the name. And I uh, was working with them and they had, they were, they were instu uh, instituting a code of honor. Um, so basically rules of the game, you know, um, how do we play the game? How do we agree to operate and work together? 
And in the process of doing that, there were a couple of top performers that didn't want to play by those rules because they didn't have to up until that point. They could do whatever they wanted and they were top performers. So their results uh, were valued more than how they were handling, you know, the, the people that they were dealing with. So as soon as they put this in place, my mentor, he said, you know what, beware, you may have, you may lose a few. Hmm. There's attrition for people that don't want to operate based on this new culture that you're developing. And true to form is these uh, two people decided to leave. Yeah. What's interesting is them leaving and they lost, it was like these top, two top performers, they lost that, that um, production. And yet over the next couple of months, the rest of the team far exceeded the production of those two people because they saw that the organization was there for them and they were supporting them and that they valued them yeah. and their, and their contribution and valued them as, as human beings. Yeah. And so it far outweighed, you talk about return on investment, the investment was well worth the cost to do yeah. it. That's a great story. The, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It, yeah, it really exemplifies. And, and what that does is it removes an obstacle. Those people have been dealing with those. Those folks were kind of like a, a weight, you know, a chain around their neck, you know, or whatever you call that. And now that's gone. And so they're free to, to thrive. And it's amazing. We talk so much about leadership, as I was saying in the beginning, there's a lot of people talking about wanting to do leadership development or, you know, I hear, of course, because of my podcast, Leaders of Transformation, I get to hear a lot about it and you do too with your show, the Talent Grow Show. Yeah. And, um, you know, it, it's great. And yet at the same time, there's still so many organizations where you hear these stories of people oh saying, you know, this is all good and there's core values nice listed on the wall or mission statement, but mm -hmm. we're not living that. Yeah. That's not what happens here in this organization. And so that tells me that as much as there's a lot of conversation out there about it, we still have a long way to go in yeah. order to do that. Now, speaking of your show, I would love to hear, cause you've, had some amazing guests on your show and a few of them I'm like man how'd you you know I get so many guests I know you probably do too so many people wanting to get on the show that I I still have a list of people that I actually want to go out and reach out to to ask them to be on the show but I've just got this queue of um of people that are amazing as well and so um but you've had some extraordinary guests on your show what have been some of the greatest insights and learnings that you've picked up from those guests? Yeah, so, so many, right? It's, I know I'm uh, putting you on the spot, aren't I? Well, no, it's just... Fun being on the other side, is it? <laughs> yeah, it's fun. Well, first of all, I, I absolutely just love... I know that you do too. I love having a podcast. I love that I started it uh, now over almost four years ago. It's unbelievable how fast the time is going. And it's so great to be able to talk to a lot of different people from very many different backgrounds and walks of life and learn from them. One um, piece of advice that seems to come up, I always ask at the very end of the show for people to give one actionable tip that people can use to ratchet up or upgrade their leadership skills or their career or communication skills, because that's the topics of my podcast. And what's amazing is that this one piece of advice is repeated a lot. It's actually just, um, I would say, one of the most given ones is to seek feedback. So uh, people describe that you should ask the people that you trust in a lot of different arenas of life for feedback, and you should ask them, like, what's something that um, I'm doing well that I should keep doing. And what's one thing that I could do differently that would make me even more effective and then listen. And this is such simple, you know, you and I as coaches, we know this is simple, but it's like bread and butter. This is so good. And we just earlier talked about, you know, people who don't get it. Like it's, you know, we see ourselves in the mirror. We see ourselves inside our head. We don't really see ourselves as others do. So it's, in some ways, it can be really reaffirming and empowering to hear what others see in us as strengths. And um, it might show you something that you didn't realize other people see as, as a strength for you, but it also might just confirm things that you felt were strengths. And it's nice to know that other people also think that. But it also helps you understand your blind spots. So it's a great and simple exercise. You don't need some kind of a special assessment. And it's always amazing to me that another guest says it and another guest says it, again, from really different backgrounds. So that, like, that's one of the things that I, 
um, I also have advised that. And what's funny is those guests, when they say that, I don't know if you remember when you were on my show, one of the things that I do, because I believe in this advice so much, is whenever I finish a podcast recording with someone, when we stop the recording and we just, we do a little bit of debrief, debriefing afterwards, I always say, how was that for you? And what's one thing that I could do differently to make the, uh, the experience better for the next guest, for anywhere from the scheduling process, the preparation, and up to and including the actual interview. And I always ask that. So when the guest just told me that I should do that, it almost feels like I'm, you know, I'm implementing their advice or just doing it on the fly. But I really do always use that because we're all on a learning journey. All of us are unfinished. We're never going to finish. And we always have an opportunity to continue to improve. And we should always seek to. So I, I am a, a, a fervent believer in it, but I love the affirmation when, when guests use that as their tip. That's great. And I love feedback. Um, it's funny because I used to avoid feedback like the plague, but because I was expecting people like, you know, when you think of feedback, if somebody says, I've got some feedback for you, yeah, you think it's that's bad. usually not a good thing. Yeah. You know, in organizations, it's interesting uh, when you think of performance reviews, people are like, okay, you know, give it to me. Right. Mm -hmm. Same thing with, you know, any kind of feedback is they're afraid of the negative that's going to come back. And that's actually a good point is that when you're giving feedback to people, don't just focus on all the things they're doing wrong. Uh, don't sugarcoat it either. But then what I'm also hearing you say is it's like, tell them what they're, what they're, excuse me, what they're good at. Yeah. It's interesting, certain cultures, you know, they, they aren't a fan. In, in North America, we do this sandwich approach, right? I'm going to tell you something positive, and then I'm going to slip something in there. And then not necessarily, I'm not talking about that. Certain cultures do not appreciate that at all because they no. think it's an indirect, you know, it's manipulative and so forth. Yeah, I actually have a blog post that says, don't serve the feedback sandwich. I don't believe that that's a good idea at all. There you go. Talk about that. Yeah, so I, I think... Yes, I agree with everything you've said. You should tell people the things that they're doing well. And you should talk about things that they can improve. And people are afraid of feedback. And it's usually because of poorly delivered feedback or manipulative feedback or um, overdue feedback that's been hoarded up for that stupid yearly performance assessment, review, whatever. I'm, I'm not a fan of that process either. So here's what I think. Feedback should be as close to in the moment as possible. But if it's a constructive feedback, like you should do this differently, it should be privately delivered, not in front of others, not in any way that can cause the person shame or embarrassment. Um, and it should be given in isolation of other feedback because if you're not hoarding it up, you don't need to deliver both the good and the bad and the three things, but really just make it so that it's timely and specific and focused on actionable, observable behaviors that they need to change and the impact, like the why. You have to describe the why. And so if you do it like really short, don't, don't make it into like a big thing. Um, don't build up to it. And you can talk about the positives, but I think you should talk about the positives separately too. There is a lot of research that comes out of the world of positive psychology that says that what we need to do in our relationships and our important relationships, both at work and in regular life, is we need to um, create an imbalance between positive interactions and negative interactions such that the positive ones way outweigh the, the negative ones. So what that means is if you're trying to be a good leader, you should deliver positive feedback whenever you see it and you should actually try to find, catch people doing things well so that you can give them sincere, uh, genuine, positive feedback in isolation without any kind of but. You know, I, I like to uh, liken this. The, I think the feedback sandwich causes people to expect that if you get positive feedback, guess what's coming next, right? Because you know yeah. that it's sort of the tee up. So it's almost like, you know, a cotton ball. A cotton ball is a lovely, fluffy thing but when you start to experience that whenever there is a fluffy cotton ball on your arm, the next thing is a needle pricking you, you start to hate the cotton ball. It's no Great longer like analogy. this. analogy. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's not a benevolent fluffy thing anymore because it always is followed with a needle. So now I'm afraid of cotton balls. Same thing with positive feedback. So keep it separate. Make it specific. Make it timely. Tell them exactly what you like about what they did or how they're doing something so that they know what to repeat. And don't follow it up with a negative. And that way, and do that a lot. So now if you have like a five, to shoot for a five to one ratio. 
So now, now if most of your interactions are positive and they know that they get pure, positive, sincere, not fake uh, feedback from you, then when you have something that you want to tell them about, something that they're doing ineffectively or that they could be doing even better, and you deliver it in a way that's focused on factual stuff in a short format, as close as possible so that you're not allowing them, hey, you know, for the, I've noticed for the last six months you've been doing this wrong. Well, thanks so much for letting me do it wrong for six months. I appreciate that. Yeah. So if you do it as close as possible and you give them the specifics and you tell them how to build it up, how to change it and help them and support them, now those conversations are not that terrible. People are more open to it and it's more likely to create sort of a benevolent upcycle of feedback. Well, and they also trust you enough to know that you're for them. I think yeah. a lot of times, um, you know, having coached people on a personal level, and even in, it, it shows up in business as a business coach, is that people are, there's like this, this lie that we tell ourselves or this fear that we have that we're not good enough. Yeah. And so, you know, we're the feedback, we're afraid of the feedback because it's going to prove that to be true. And we're trying to do everything possible to avoid that actually being true. Well, if you're investing in people and actually telling them what they're doing well, then it's like, I love that balance, that five to one balance yeah. that you talk and about. And also if, yeah. if you're following my, my, my podcast guests advice and you're actually asking people for feedback, the other thing that we didn't talk about, but they come to this person's world in the same way is that this is a leader who's asking me for feedback about them too right? Again, yes. separately, but also doing that. So it does, I think, add to what you were saying, which is create, it creates trust that you have um, good intentions and that you want to build people up and that you also want feedback, that you know nobody's perfect and we're all on a journey. Ooh, that's good because that actually means it's going both ways. It's not just a leader. And we're talking about developing leaders that other people want to follow is being the leader that is willing to ask for feedback Mm -hmm. And to say, well, how can I improve as a leader? And then if I, as that leader, then want to offer feedback to them at some point, positive feedback, you did that really well, or, hey, I would recommend that, you know, that this didn't work as well as, you know, then, then, and to adjust it, then it comes in the context of, I'm willing to give it. I don't, I don't just, I just don't dish it out. Yeah and then resist it coming back the other way. So it's twofold. So then it develops uh, the culture of feedback, which is, yes. which is so very important. So yes. this is so good. I think all our listeners just need to go and listen to your podcast, The Talent Grow Show. We're going to have that in the show notes and make sure they can have access to that because you do have some amazing guests on there and you bring in your own perspective and experience into this, just like what we're talking about here with this feedback, brilliant, brilliant insights. Now, I know you also talk about effective communication. You have a gift for our audience. You want to talk about that? Yeah, yeah. So at, you know, really part of leadership, part of high performance, part of, of being good at whatever you do and in a relationships, communication is sort of like the, the, the glue that holds it all together or can be what makes it all fall apart. And uh, in my experience, I've learned a thing or two about how to be a more engaging communicator. And I'd love to uh, give you listeners and, and viewers a 10, 10 ways to become a more engaging communicator guide. And uh, I'll make that for free. And I'll put that on my website at talentgrow.com forward slash L-O-T for leaders of transformation. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, and you are a great communicator. And I just yeah. even listening to you and watching you, uh, some of our listeners are watching uh, the video, some of you are just listening to the audio. Um, you can tell that, um, uh, that you understand how to communicate and you really care about people that comes through um, yeah. very well. Your heart comes through for people is to empower people to truly be the best that they're that they, they can be. So Thank, thank you for That's being true. on the show and, and thank you to uh, our listeners and our audience and our watching audience for being here as well. I always say at the end of uh, every single one of my episodes is I always say, you know what? Leaders take action. Transformation doesn't happen in a bubble. It doesn't happen with reading a book or even listening to a podcast, you know, watching videos. All of that is great. But until you take action, nothing happens. And so I encourage you, if you're listening out there, is to take something uh, that uh, Halili has been sharing today and take something and apply it. 
whether it's asking for feedback, whether, it, and that's actually a really great place to start before you start disseminating feedback to others. Maybe you want to start getting it first so that you set the example for others to create the space for them, for it to be comfortable for them to receive feedback and, or better yet, not even wait to have to receive the feedback is they're going to come to you and say, can you give me feedback on how that went? And they're going to be much more open and receptive when they're actually asking for it and they're aware of the, the, the benefits of asking for it. Or maybe it's just learning and saying, okay, how can we incorporate leadership development into our organization uh, through the mentorship, mentee uh, relationship, through volunteering, finding these opportunities? We've covered a lot of ground here today. And so I encourage you to take something and take action on it. And that's where the greatest impact will happen. So I encourage you to that. We'll make sure all of the um, links, uh, the links that to uh, Holly's books and her podcast and also the 10 ways to become a more engaging communicator guide. We'll make sure that's all on the leaders of transformation.com. And uh, uh, her website is talentgrow.com. Talentgrow.com forward slash LOT is where you can also get that 10 ways uh, guide. And uh, we thank you for being here and encourage you to continue to make a difference out there. I believe that every single person is, is a leader at some level is, and is capable of being a more effective leader and creating transformation in your own world, your own community. And so we encourage you to continue to do that. Love to hear your stories. You can find us on Facebook, uh, certainly at our, on our website, and tell us your stories. Tell us how you're making an impact uh, we'd love to hear from you. So we thank you and we look forward to seeing you on the next episode of Leaders of Transformation real soon.